Less than 36 hours before the polls open in Northern Ireland's Assembly election, the leaders of the five main parties face questions from a studio audience here in Belfast. Welcome to the Leaders' Debate. Good evening. 90 seats at Stormont are up for grabs and the leaders of the parties expected to take the lion's share of those seats are with us tonight. It's an election that could have profound implications on the direction of politics in Northern Ireland and even across the UK. A big welcome to all of our viewers on BBC One Northern Ireland and the BBC News Channel. Over the next hour, our politicians will face questions from our audience made up of grassroots party supporters and some undecided voters. We're not quite yet at pre-COVID capacity, but it's great to have an audience here. And if you have a stake in this election, I hope tonight's debate can help you make your choices on Thursday. The leaders with us tonight are Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, less than a year into the top job with the Democratic Unionist Party. Will his party retain the top spot at Stormont for Unionists? Or will that shift to Sinn Féin, the pro-Irish Unity Party, represented tonight by its Vice President and Stormont leader, Michelle O'Neill? The Northern Ireland system asks parties to designate unionist, nationalist or other. Alliance is in the other category and its leader, Naomi Long, has seen her party doing well in the opinion polls. How will that translate into votes and seats? The leader of the nationalist, Social Democratic and Labour Party, Colm Eastwood, is here to argue his case. He improved his position at the last Westminster election. And completing the lineup tonight is also unionist leader Doug Beatty, who has been reshaping his party's message and is also less than a year into the leadership role. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel for this evening. <laughs> now, if you want to join the discussion on social media, it's hashtag BBCNIDebate. Let's have our first question, and it comes tonight from Joe Hutchinson. Joe is in, uh, from Coleraine, and he works in hospitality. Joe. Well, all the party leaders commit right now that if they are elected, they will turn up on day one and form an executive, and if they don't, well, they refuse to pay. Geoffrey Donaldson, will you turn up for work, form an executive, and if not, will you refuse your pay? Well, I've never shirked a day's work uh, in all of my political career. I will be there on day one to meet the other parties, to discuss um, or begin discussions about a programme for government, about setting a three-year budget. But I'm also clear, and we're being honest with the electorate about this, we believe that the political institutions must be sustainable. Uh, and that means we've got to deal with the big issues that are in front of us, and not least the harm that the Northern Ireland Protocol is doing uh, to undermine political stability in Northern Ireland, to undermine uh, economic stability. It's changed our constitutional status, and we can't ignore that. Um, and if we're, if we're going to have um, a, a sustainable executive, it must be one that has cross-community support, um, where consensus is the way that we move forward, and there isn't unionist support for the protocol. So, so this issue needs to be dealt with. OK, so you're saying, you're saying that issue needs to be dealt with, uh, and therefore you're not taking... Uh, you're not forming an executive, but you'll still take your pay. I mean, what about you personally? Uh, you're an MP at Westminster. You haven't resigned your Westminster seat. Who's going to be paying you? Is it going to be Westminster or Stormont? Can you guarantee uh, the audience here tonight, Joe, who asked the question, that you will be taking your seat at Stormont? Well, I wouldn't be standing as a candidate leading uh, my party into this election if it wasn't my intention to lead my party into the Assembly. Your intention um, doesn't quite sound like a guarantee well, that you will take your seat. Will because, you take Jim, your seat? unlike you, I don't take the electorate for granted. I will fight for every vote. No, I'm I've not never, asking, in my I'm asking if you win your seat at the Assembly, will you take that seat? Of but course. I am committed to leading the DUP into uh, an executive, but we must deal with the issues that are in front of us. We must deal with the protocol. We've got to get political stability back in Northern Ireland. We have to have an executive formed on the basis that can command cross-community support. And right now, um, 
Uh, there is not unionist support for the protocol. Okay. It is harming our politics in Northern Ireland. It is undermining our economy. Uh, it is well, let, let, uh, damaging the, the political institutions, and we need Joe, to deal with those things. Okay, let's stick to Joe's uh, question here, Naomi Law. Will you be turning up, uh, forming an executive? Uh, and if not, uh, will you be taking your pay? Well, I will be there on day one, ready to enter an executive if the electorate give me the if the electorate give me the mandate to do so. And I think it would be obscene at a time when the real issues that are facing people um, are the cost of living crisis, the pressures in our health service, the challenges that we have around climate change, and all of the other things that face us. If we were to continue to take salaries during a period when we weren't doing our jobs, I think it's really important that those of us who are willing to turn up and willing to get on with the job are able to do that and be paid for that job. It's right that we should, but we should not be locked out as we have been in the past for long periods. And that's why we want to see reform of the institutions so that we can actually have sustainable government here. There are lots of issues that need to be dealt with, but I certainly don't want the embarrassment, frankly, of being an assembly member again during suspension while people are struggling to heat their homes and feed their families. And I'm being paid for less than the full job that I was elected to do. Uh, Doug Beatty, you haven't uh, so far, as far as I know, committed to definitely being part of that executive. Uh, will you be joining an opposition? Uh, what do you say to Joe's question about taking pay if there isn't a functioning government? Well, well I think Joe raises a, a fundamental question that, that we all have to answer at some stage. Uh, and that is, I think we will all turn up on, on the Monday morning and we will all look to go into the executive if we have enough seats to be able to go into that executive. But what's really important for us is, where is that executive taking us? What is that programme of government going to be? Where are we going to be in five years or ten years' time? If we're all being asked to jump into an executive before we even know the direction of travel of that executive, then we all go into something that could just give us the same as what we've had for the last five years, stale government. So what we've always advocated for is that we organise quickly, we have uh, uh, really deep discussions about a programme for government, get that programme for government agreed before we run the hunt, before we have ministers, and then we can form uh, an executive. I should but, just say that the hunt is the procedure by yeah. which <coughs> ministerial positions are allocated between the but, parties. But it's an important point, and I'll tell you why it's an important point, because right now we all rush into to nominating who's going to be the Minister for Health, who's going to be the Minister for Infrastructure, who's going to be in education. And then they go in there and they go into a silo mentality. But if you agree the programme for government first, its outcomes, what the budget's going to be, how we're going to pool and share that budget, if you agree that first before you put ministers in place, then we have a programme for government that we're all signed up to. And I think that's an important way for us to travel um, in this next government. Uh, Michelle O'Neill. Uh, it's not just the DUP that have stepped down uh, from the executive uh, in the past. They, of course, uh, Paul Given, the, the First Minister, resigned in February 2022. Uh, but your party, Sinn Féin, uh, pulled down the executive in 2017 and it was out of business for three years when the cost in salaries was £15 million. Uh, are you going to let that happen again? I think it's absolutely unfathomable that actually we'd be sitting here tonight in front of the electorate and tell them that there's not going to be a government on the other side of this election. This is a democratic process that we're all engaged in. And I listened to Jeffrey speak about you know, what he wants to do in executive or even Doug in terms of negotiating a programme for government. And those things are all important and let's have those conversations. But what I still don't hear tonight even in these first few minutes of this conversation, is that if they're going to accept the democratic outcome of the election, I think that's what the public want to hear. I've been on the doors, we all have. And I... <laughs> We've all engaged in the public for, for a considerable period of time now. And the things that the public want us to respond to is trying to put money in their pockets to help them tr deal with the cost of living crisis. It's about trying to invest in our health service. So all the, the plans in the world won't deliver that unless you're actually going to accept but, the democratic But you outcome. stayed out of government over issues like Irish language. Uh, you know, it wasn't cost of living then, it was the Irish Language Act. Well, the DUP not equally entitled to choose the protocol as their issue on which to negotiate. But I think the DUP are dishonest with the public because they're holding us all to ransom, they're holding our politics to ransom and they're holding our public to ransom. Whilst the rest of us want to put money into people's pockets and deal with the cost of living crisis, the DUP are telling people that their identity is under threat when that is not a question whatsoever. It's not what we're telling the people and, of Northern and, Ireland, and, Michelle. And, and if, you're just, if you let me finish the point, Geoffrey, and then sure, come back to me. But you're, what you're telling the electorate is that you won't accept the democratic outcome of the election. And I want us to make politics work. I want everybody well, to make you're, politics you're, you're, work. You're, you're, you're shaking your head, yeah. 
well, that's not what I've said. And, you know, whilst Michelle says she'll be there on day one, the last time round, she wasn't there until day 1044. Well, Jeffrey, three as you know, years you were in after she walked the away Tories. from the Department of Health, she was Minister of Health at the time, and in those three years, the waiting list grew and grew and grew, and now we have to clear up the mess that was left behind. But, but if Sinn leaving Fein government is such a bad thing, why but, did you do it? But, but from day one, <laughs> Naomi Long will be the Minister of Justice. Uh, Robin Swan will be the Minister of Health. They continue in their posts. This idea Jim. that we go back to a Stormont where there are no that, ministers in place and is simply not true. They're, they're well, okay. caretaker well, ministers. They're caretaker okay, ministers. Okay, well, let me, let me bring in still ministers and they're still able to take decisions. Conor Murphy recently okay. took a decision to allocate £400 million to the health service without executive approval. That proves that decisions okay, so can just, be it, taken well, by these ministers. Jeffrey Donaldson, and let's, get on let's with bring in Colm Eastwood. It seems as if it doesn't matter if you pull people out of the executive. Uh, well, but anyway, answer Joe's question. Well, there's, first. There's, there's no budget. Um, there's no budget for next year, so we can talk all we want there's tonight about all the year. issues. No, there isn't. There's, there's no, no, there's no there's budget not. agreed uh, for next year. The reality is, we can't. We can talk about the cost of living, and we can talk about uh, health, and, and we, we can will talk, talk about, about all these. some of those no, issues. I, know, I think just to get this out of the way first. Nothing will be done about any of these issues if we don't have a government. And Jeffrey again today is refusing to say whether he will form one because he wants a deal between the British government and the European Commission. Well, that's up to them. We can talk to them, we can negotiate with them, we can, but we can't stop government here just because that hasn't well, been Colin, done you yet. You may not be want, to be want to be part of the... I'm part of this question. You, you may not want to be part of the debate about our future in terms of <laughs> this protocol and the way in which... Well, um, I know who we, was part of the debate Jeffrey, the last time, and I know why we're in this in the situation. Way, Colin, in which we have laws imposed upon us in Northern Ireland over which we have no say. Jeffrey, I want to be elected by the people of Northern Ireland to make their laws. We can have them imposed upon us by no, Brussels. No, no, I, so I, let's change that. Let's get lawmaking <laughs> back at Stormont where it really belongs. Good idea. That's what well, I well, want to achieve. That's what the DUP is at, out to achieve. That's why we okay. want to support International, international agreements are not. not under the auspices of the Assembly or the Executive. That's for Westminster. That's the job you had when you 10 DUP MPs, when you had the ear of the Conservative government and you had a deal with them. And what did you deliver but the mess that we're in now that no, you're complaining about? No, so, I mean, no. if you want to do the job <laughs> and if you want to tell those of us who are still in ministerial positions to get on with the job, do your job and actually step up and say you're willing to well, form a government. Well, Naomi, we are doing our job. We are at West Westminster fighting the case for Northern Ireland, whilst others don't bother to take their seats, turn up and make the case for Northern Ireland. And will we will accept, continue will to do that. The but let's be clear, election, I don't Jeffrey. agree with Naomi Long. She says, leave it to Westminster to sort this out. No, I that's say not what that I the said. people of Northern well, Ireland... Let, let me bring the audience. I said the Assembly can't let, do it. Let me bring the audience. Let me bring the audience in. Jeffrey Donaldson, let me bring the audience in. And I think just in the back row there, the woman with her hand up, please. Yeah, it just seems that Jeffrey seems to be showboating to all the people. You know, if you want to show up to further act it, show up. It's not an issue. If you're gonna if you're gonna run, take your seats and go in and form a government, say that you're gonna do it instead of turning around and saying we're gonna solve the protocol. It's an issue that if you're gonna stand in an election and you're going to form a government, say yes here tonight that you're going to do it, instead of leaving everyone here in limbo, not knowing what's going to happen come Friday. OK, I'll oh. come back to back you in a minute. And, uh, gentlemen in the third row here. Yes, please, sir. Yeah, I'm from a border community. You know, the protocol is crucial for us. It's a compromise. There are over 40 million vehicle moves across this border annually. And it is an absolute fact that the protocol issues will be resolved between the UK government and the EU Commission. The Assembly has no input whatsoever. Yep. That's and, and that, that actually well, isn't it, true. The Assembly not... does have an input, and that's written into the protocol itself. It's uh, inadequate. But this is an opportunity for the people of Northern Ireland but to have their just say. Just explain and, to and, them clearly why not going into government helps you renegotiate the protocol. Because it How's sends it a very... Because I went into the executive back at the beginning of 2020 on the basis of an agreement that all of these parties signed up to called New Decade, New Approach. And in that agreement, it stated clearly that the UK government was committed 
to protecting Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market. The UK government failed to deliver that. And I am entitled to say the agreement has been breached. But why and until, the the public until, here? until why that agreement, why, why until that agreement is honoured by the government, I think I'm entitled to say the basis on which I uh, entered the executive has not been met. And I'm entitled to say to the government that, that they need to resolve this. They so can do it. OK, okay. And, uh, just, just to say, and just to go back to the original question then, until that is resolved, you will take your pay but not enter government? No. Uh, I am saying that we will, of course, continue to do our job. Uh, we will represent the people who elect us. We are seeking a mandate. You but can't I'm do your job out of people. the executive. I am, it's not as if I am stepping back and saying one thing. Uh, I have made clear that we want to see the protocol issue resolved quickly because it is undermining political stability in Northern Ireland. And I understand the points that are being made. But if we had a situation where one side agreed something and the other side didn't. That's not consensus. The okay. unionist it, community do not exist. OK, call me, we, 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 we'll we'll get in, then I'll come to you, Michelle. Call me, so quickly. Je no, well, Geoffrey said quite a lot there. The reality is Geoffrey's waiting on Boris Johnson to ride over the hill and save him. Ask everybody else who ever trusted Boris Johnson uh, in his life no, how no. that ended up. Geoffrey wants to make this election about the union. This election is not about the colour of people's passports in their pockets. It's about us needing to get round the table and get money into their pockets because they're starving, they can't turn their heating on. That's the real issue that are facing. And you must be hearing it, Geoffrey. You must be hearing the and same I'm... thing that I'm hearing on the doors. And they don't care about protocols or positions at Stormont. They want money in their pockets because well, they, they're Colin, really, that, really struggling out there. That is simply not true. It is true, uh, Geoffrey. And I'm sorry, but it's not. I'm talking to many people, and for them, they are concerned. The people at those rallies because, you're going because, to, Geoffrey, might be concerned. Colin, but ordinary people... I'm not concerned the about The protocol it. is driving up... <laughs> the protocol... The protocol is driving okay, up... Let me, let me Brexit is doing that. Oh, okay, Michelle, I don't want to go back the to the audience. It's driving up the cost well, of energy. Jeffrey, but it is increasing the cost of food we, in Northern Ireland. Right, right, right. But, right. but Geoffrey Donaldson, if you're going to quote statistics, tell us where they're from. Yeah. I, I can certainly tell you where they are from. Uh, they come from uh, the uh, 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 monthly survey that takes place uh, of um, uh, goods in Northern Ireland and the comparison between those goods and the cost of goods in... in <laughs> I know, but, 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 but does, idea, that, does that but break out what costs are due to the protocol no. or what costs are due to Brexit well, or what costs we, are due to Northern Ireland it, being yes, uh, a different do, part of the know, UK? We know, for example, that the cost of bringing goods from, Northern, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland in the first year of the protocol has increased by 27%. Those figures came from the hauliers in Northern Ireland, not from me, and those costs are passed on to the consumer. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 And, and it drives up Jim. the cost of... Jeffrey, let, someone else, let someone else get a chance. The, those back of the envelope calculations don't wash it. No. They don't wash it with the public at all. But Geoffrey made a point about consensus politics, and I think that's an important conversation. I believe in partnership working, and I believe in working with others. But when Geoffrey refers to consensus politics, he means on his terms. And that is not, that is not where we are today, and that's not where we're going to be again okay. in the future. We're going to have to call, <laughs> call, it, <laughs> call time on this question. No, come back, come back uh, maybe long later, but we will run out of time if we spend all of the time on our first question. So let's get on to our second question, and it comes from Maxwell Smith, a teacher from Belfast. Maxwell. Um, hello. Um, do you want there to be a border poll after this election? Michelle O'Neill. And I should just say for some viewers, just to explain, a border poll is a referendum on Irish unity. Yeah, I mean, I've always made the case that we have the outworking of the Good Friday Agreement, that we should have, the, the public should have their say in a border poll or a unity referendum. And, that, want the and, and Maxwell, my, my uh, response to that is that I want to have it whenever it is the right time. I don't, I'm not fixated on a date, but I'm very fixated on the planning because Brexit's a good case in point around how not to do a referendum. So whenever it comes to the point... <laughs> Whenever it comes to the time where, where everybody will have their say, so let's make that also very, very clear. It'll only be the people here that will ever decide a constitutional change. And that's a good thing for us all to get engaged in in terms of the conversation. But what I am saying in terms of... I'm on the doors. That's what people are telling me. It's about what this executive can do. So, so you're not I, going to use any increased mandate as a, as a reason to call my, for a border poll? I, I have been calling for Citizens' Assembly to plan for change for some time. That will continue. And this conversation that's already started will continue regardless of the outcome of the election. OK, Doug Beatty, do you want to see a border poll after this election? There's not going to be. Republicans will still want a united Ireland. Unionists will still want a united kingdom. But what we have to do is try and advocate for the people here in Northern Ireland on the here and now. Uh, and we're right to say that the cost of living is not a tagline. It is not a strapline. It is a lived experience. And we have to...
put forward firm proposals to spend that £300 That's million. That's not true. But, you know, as Doug said... Uh, well, there's the email, uh, Naomi. Well, you might you definitely sent it. the email, but you're not the only party that had a plan. We've been talking about this for months. said, class. and he's right, that, that at the heart of this is the increase in the cost of food. So let me quote you the figures, Jim, that I mentioned earlier, because I think this is important. As a direct result of the increased cost in bringing food products from Great Britain to Northern Ireland due to the protocol, consumers in Northern Ireland are paying an average 4% more per item than they are in Great Britain at the moment. And when you look at dairy products, that rises to 8%. And when you look at chilled convenience products goods, it rises to 19% more for here. those products than they are paying in Great Britain. Britain. That's the protocol. That's why it needs to be sorted As a direct out, because it is the protocol. Just again, the just, just so people can check. Ireland. And I don't have I don't have those statistics in front of me. But just so people you can know. check them. Uh, what's the source of the those source statistics? of that? Is the Cantar GB panel average price tracker and the Cantar and Northern Ireland panel Just to panel be clear, is it, does the Cantar tracker. survey say it's directly related to the protocol? It, 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 yes, it demonstrates it that not. the additional costs are linked to the increase in but just, transporting... No, no, just to be clear, just, uh, if well, you're quoting it, can you be clear that it says yes, that it's directly that related to the protocol? I am clear. So the the because because, you, because I'm not aware of Cantor doing the survey stuff. on the protocol. I am clear, Jim. I am clear. Well, go and check it out if you wish. But I am clear that uh, the additional cost... Well, uh, what is the difference between food, the cost of food in Great Britain and the cost of food in Northern Ireland? Well, Doug extra, says a large extra, part is to do with the fuel. extra customs checks that we have to pay for. It's the delays in transporting goods because of those customs checks. It's the additional paperwork. It's the additional staff that have okay. to be employed. Um, well, and it's the long. additional transport cost as a result of the protocol. It may is driving long. up the cost of living in Northern Ireland. I really hope somebody is doing a kind of fact check on some of what we're hearing this evening because it's outrageous. First of all, Geoffrey did send an email. I can confirm that. He is not the only party that has come forward with proposals around the cost of living crisis. That is false. In fact, all of the parties um, brought forward proposals on the cost of living crisis, but the reality was we couldn't implement them because Geoffrey withdrew their first minister, so we didn't have an executive to take new or novel cross-cutting decisions. And that's the law. Now, Geoffrey might feel that he can simply stand like King Canute in front of the courts and deny that it exists, but that isn't how the law works. We have have taken advice as ministers as to how far we can so make decisions. How come, how we come, can take how come certain Connor decisions. Murphy was able to allocate on, 400 uh, let, let million me pounds speak. to you, the health service? You've had quite a lot of time, Geoffrey. I would like to make my point, if that's OK. You are able to allocate additional funding to things you're already doing, but you cannot do new things, novel so things. So what about across, the energy payment no, support? Geoffrey and Dawson, let, let things. me along finish. And, and just cross, to return to the core and, of the question. Yes, and when it, ter when it comes to issues around cost of living, they have to be cross-cutting because there is no one department that holds all of the answers to this. So for a start, the UK government needs to step in. There needs to be a windfall tax when it comes to the extortionate profits that some energy companies are making. That needs to be dealt with. There's also been the issue of increasing national insurance contributions. I think that should be reversed. I think that was a poor decision in terms of timing. In terms of what the executive can do in our plans, we believe a home heating voucher scheme would go a long way to helping people actually be able to keep warm. We have, we have proposed a child payment of £20 per week per child for those children who are below school age um, in the most need, on the, on the homes in most need. We have also proposed okay. the free school meal should be extended and the longer term project. The thing that I think is really important is we are proposing, for example, retrofitting homes mm. with insulation so that we can actually make people's homes warmer and reduce their energy bills long term. We've talked about investment in renewables. Okay, that's a good list. I don't know if we can get... Investment in renewables so that we have secure energy because much of what is pushing up the cost of energy and the cost of food <clears> is the fact that we have a war going on in Ukraine right, and that is impacting let, let directly on Let me get back to the audience uh, here and just see what, what other uh, ideas people have uh, in the audience. Uh, just the front row uh, here, yes. We hear Geoffrey Donaldson is managing to make poverty into a green and orange issue. Not Does he really accept not. that this is why people have lost interest in politics and is why people have lost faith in really the Stormont not. executive? Because he's managed to take the cost of living crisis and make it green and orange. OK, let me bring in uh, others. Thanks for that. Um, uh, let me see, where have we got uh, anybody else want to come in? Yes, just at the very back row there. Yes, sir. I think what so much of this conversation tonight has demonstrated is the need to reform the institutions. Because as long as one party can hold everyone else to ransom, we won't solve any of yeah. these issues. Whether it's Jeffrey on the protocol or anyone else, on any other issue, we need to recognise the need for reform of the institutions. Here, here. Okay, well, uh, you're, you're, 
you're being accused of holding everybody else to ransom, Jeffrey Dalton. I'm certainly not doing that. And this isn't an orange or green issue. And in fact, our proposals to support working families in Northern Ireland is for everyone. Uh, the cost of living affects everyone. The, the harm this protocol is doing to Northern Ireland affects everyone, regardless of your political perspective. That's why instead of burying our heads in the sand and pretending there isn't a problem, let's deal with the problem immediately so that we Fine. can have a sustainable political institutions we can work and move Northern Ireland solutions, forward together. Jeffrey, we That's can what work we want. Towards that is what solutions. we okay. want. Let, we do can anybody work in the audience just let, let me clear this up? Any, government. Uh, anybody in the audience agree with Jeffrey Donaldson's uh, points on this? Uh, he's, a lot of people are, are, are quizzing I'm him on this. Him. Anybody wanted to, to offer him some support on this one? Yes, sir. It is incontrovertibly true that uh, the protocol is contributing towards the cost of living uh, crisis. You can't separate two things. That's incontrovertibly true, but have you got the statistics? Because uh, I'm well, not that, sure I think there's a debate about that. the extent to which it is, but I think it is incontrovertibly true that it is contributing towards it. Economists can debate about the extent to which it is an issue, but it certainly isn't helping, um, and it is contributing towards a, a crisis that we're facing at the moment. Okay. Thanks so, very so much it's for contributing, that. Jim. It's contributing, yes. and, and absolutely, it's contributing. Yeah. But, but so is war in Ukraine. So, so is Brexit. So are a whole multitude of other things are all contributing to it. What you can't do, though, is stick yourself in the corner, stick your fingers in your ears, and ignore it. Uh, you need to get together. We need to get sit, stand together, sit together, uh, and come up with ways to fix there's the problem. There, and that's not what's happening. There's okay. more uh, there's I will have to call time on it there because uh, yeah, once again we've ended up uh, talking about uh, the protocol <laughs> when yeah, I think yes. the question was originally about the cost of uh, living, but thank you for your question, uh, Fiona. Now, our next question is from Lou Rooney, who's from Downpatrick and works in marketing. Uh, Lou. Thank you. How would the party leaders implement their plans for the health service when the government appear to be privatising the NHS by stealth? Doug Beatty, uh, your party held the health portfolio over the last uh, couple of years. What would you do? Well, first of all, I've got to say this, that we have held it. Uh, we, we took it when everybody else sidestepped it uh, and we said we would take it and we did take it. Uh, and Robin Swan stepped in there. And Robin Swan has been an absolutely exceptional health minister in the most difficult <laughs> times you can imagine to deal with an underfunded uh, health service, a poorly resourced health service, uh, and then also deal with, with, well, with he's COVID. Got, he's, he's ended his tenure so far uh, on record waiting lists, 354,756 yeah, yeah. well, well, waiting for a first appointment, around one in four well, waiting in some shape or form here in Northern Ireland, worse than anywhere else. No, and, and you're absolutely right, and, and that's what we're saying. We are underinvested in our health service and, and we reduce beds. When you reduce beds, you reduce staff. And there's one of the biggest problems that we've got, and that is we need to stabilise the workforce. I was talking to a nurse just the other day in Lurgan, uh, and she's only been a nurse for, for, for seven months, uh, and she's, she's getting something like 13, 14 pounds an hour, and she's working with an agency worker who's gone 50 pounds an hour doing the same job, and it doesn't make sense. So we have to stabilise the workforce. That's the first thing but, but, that we but have again, to do. On, on issues like that, uh, I'm, and perhaps we have to recognise, of course, well, we did have the pandemic over the last yeah, couple yeah, of years, yeah. but none of the big decisions have been taken in yes. that period. None of the big reforms that perhaps will help with the structural problems that are clearly there. They, no, they, they ha absolutely have, because Robin has published an elective care plan um, uh, and has costed, which is £700 million pounds for, for five years, uh, and he's put that in place. And what that means is, uh, when we get the funding, when we get the resourcing, when we get the multi-year budget, uh, that means that... Um, we will have a seven-day-a-week service. So what you get on a Tuesday in surgery is what you will get on a Sunday. Uh, and people may have to travel a little bit further, but they may get seen in a more timely manner. So he has put these things in place, but he hasn't got the money to be able to, to, to do it all just yet. So it's there, the plan's there. He's worked hard to do it. But without a multi-year budget, it's really hard to put this thing okay, anywhere and forward. And again, I should just explain that because of the, the, the various uh, problems at the Assembly, there isn't a three-year budget, and that seems to be having a particular impact on things like health. Uh, Colm Eastwood, uh, you know, specifically, what do you think you would do? And you've talked before, I think, about the need to take these hard choices Doug mm. Beattie talks about, you know, perhaps you might have to travel a bit further, uh, but you'll get better service, etc. That all sounds good, but when it comes to closing a hospital in somebody's constituency, it about, never happens. Yeah, but because we're not talking about closing hospitals, and I think that's been the problem in this conversation. We say to communities, we're going to take this off you, and we don't tell them what we're going to put in place. We need to use the health estate that already exists and use it better. I don't mind travelling a bit further to get an operation that I've been waiting for for five years, if I can be guaranteed that I'm getting it. I think we all love the NHS. We particularly love the people who work in it. We need to pay them properly, all of them. Um, but we also need to be able to get access to it. It's no good saying it's free if people are going to the credit union to borrow money to go private to get 
fairly simple operations that they've been waiting for for five or six years. I know so many people in that situation. It's absolutely wrong, but it takes courage from political leaders. We're prepared to come together with other political leaders and do that. We also think we need to give, uh, put a permanent secretary in charge of transformation themselves. There's lots of things that they need to do, but we need to show commitment from the very top of the civil well, service well, and, from the, and from, uh, from the political establishment as well. I'm also very concerned given the pandemic that we've just been through. And it is right that Robin uh, did a fantastic job there. But we are now faced with a pandemic of mental health that we need to deal with. One of the things that we think needs to happen there is a junior minister for mental health needs to be appointed to show that we as politicians are committed to dealing with this crisis. And it is a crisis. It's getting worse every single day. Okay. We're committed to that. And it, but the only way we'll do it, I'm going to keep saying this, is have a government next week. Naomi Long. Well, I mean, look, I think it's really crucial that we get started um, at, the, at, at the first opportunity to start the reform of the health service because I think what Doug and Colm have already said is really important. We have no time to waste. People are languishing on waiting lists, some of the longest waiting lists in Western Europe. People are dying on waiting lists and are not being seen. And what we essentially have in many parts of the health service is a reduction down to a red flag and a blue light service where people who have chronic illness don't get treated at all and where people are, are seeing a notional health service rather than a national one. It will take difficult decisions and that's why irrespective of which of us at this table takes on the health ministry in the next mandate I am pledged to supporting them in making those difficult decisions because it is in my interest and in your interest as members of the public that we get the health service right. People have been saying that for, for years we're willing to but take the difficult decisions it. but they've never done it. They haven't been doing it and I am saying we will do it and you can hold us to account if we don't. I understand I live in Belfast and people make presumptions that when we talk about having to travel a little bit further, we mean come to Belfast. Well, to be clear, I'm happy to travel a bit further if it means I go to Alton Galvin to get my, my operation instead of getting it in my local hospital. I'm happy to do that if it means I can have that done in a timely way and that other people can access the services they need. We're all going to have to make that, that stretch in terms of what we do. And then we need to invest actually in our transport infrastructure so people can access local services services because there's no point talking about going a little further to a town that maybe a village that only gets a bus once a week so we've got to get those things right we've got to get the structure right within the health service it isn't just about waiting lists either it's about primary care it's about investing in our gps it's about investing in our pharmacies and it's about investing in things like social prescribing that aren't necessarily more expensive but can be much better in but terms of outcomes we... for mental and physical um, well-being the, the, the question um the question identifies perhaps uh, you know, an increasing privatisation, but the last time waiting lists were cleared in Northern Ireland, it was through using uh, private services to get that backlog done. So do you think there is a role for the private sector? Well, I don't see it as, if you like, a long-term role, but I understand why people go and use the private sector as an extra resource at times of crisis. And the private sector, in fairness, stepped up when it came to COVID and provided additional resources so that we were able to manage that in a timely way. I think the key, if we're going to use private sector to deal with waiting lists, is that at the same time, we need to be dealing with the underlying structural problems within the health service so that when we stop investing in that way in waiting lists, they don't simply go straight back up again. Okay. And I do think that there's a key point here, Jim. You know, we send patients, for example, around the UK to get operations done. Why do we not bring the consultants here and do the surgery here where they could see more than one patient at a time and actually deal with it locally? We have the space All to right. do that. Let, let, and I know that's something that Robin has been working on. Let Michelle uh, O'Neill come in on this question. So again, just to return to the, the core question, you know, how do you stop creeping privatisation if that's what it is? Uh, the, the, the question from Lou seems to think the government appear to be privatising the NHS by stealth. Uh, but what would you do uh, to make the difference? And I, and I wouldn't disagree with Lou's assessment that that is, in fact, the intent of the Tories. But we have to fight for our health service. We have to fight for the NHS. We wouldn't have got through the last two years without those people that actually went over and above to get us through the pandemic years. But what we now need to do is fix what's wrong. And we all know what's wrong. A lady died in the streets of Newry waiting for an ambulance to come. That's not to, to you know, discredit the ambulance service. It's because the system is broken and it must be fixed now. Others can say that it's a priority, but you actually have to back that up then by supporting the budget, which is to give that £1 billion extra. But, but people have to understand what that's for, and it's for a reason. It's to deal with the waiting list backlog. 
over 400,000 people. And will people that involve the with. private sector, just to be clear? So part of Robin's elective care plan, which is basically how you do scheduled operations without them being interrupted by emergency care, is actually looking at temporarily using some of that, but we should not. That's not our solution. Our no. solution is investing in our health service, investing in our staff, a workforce plan, safe staffing levels, a recruitment and retention strategy. These are all the things that actually are the components that will bring together a better health system. There is dire chronic need for this extra billion pound in health and that's why we've prioritised well, you, you were a, a health minister before. Uh, would your party take uh, the role again? Well, obviously we're asking for the biggest possible support we can get in this election and then the more votes we have, the more seats we have, the more departments we have a choice of. And yeah. obviously health, first choice, health, health will be in the mix. In the mix. It's but, rarely but been the first choice. I think that's fair Jim, to Jim, say. Jim, um, we need to, we need, I mean, we need to humanise this. Because what we're doing is, is sometimes we're throwing out far too many stats. Uh, we're throwing out what we what we aspirationally want to do, and we have to absolutely humanise this. And everybody has a story to tell about the NHS and and, and how it's done them uh, fantastic work for them, or 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 how it it hasn't because of the system. Tomorrow's the anniversary of the death of my 18-month-old grandson who died on a waiting list. So that's the human side of this. People are dying on waiting lists, and we can't squabble about this anymore. Mm -hmm. We can't just talk about this because it helps us get elected or get a vote. We have to do this now to service the people out there because our people are dying on waiting lists and we need to humanise it every time that happens. Uh, and I think Michelle's telling us about what happened in Uri actually does that also. Uh, Geoffrey Donaldson? Well, humanising it means putting the additional investment in, which will deliver, a one, an extra £1 billion will deliver 750,000 additional procedures in our health service, which will drive down waiting lists. And we're committed to that. We've outlined that in our plans to fix the NHS. But it also means uh, recruiting more staff into the NHS. Um, uh, the, the courageous does it, people... Does it also mean, as Colm Eastwood has repeatedly said, going back into government? It absolutely well, means going uh, back it, into it the government. It means recruiting more staff into the NHS. Uh, we can do that now. Uh, we need more it? GPs so Who's that there is access to primary care. I'm sure many of my colleagues, I certainly have heard out on the doorsteps from people who can't get access to their GP, and it's important that we have more GPs. We need to train and recruit more GPs. We're committed to that. Let me give you an example, and I think this is important. Um, and a mention has been made of the privatisation or uh, use of, for example, agency staff. Um, uh, as a result of an FOI request that we did, we discovered that for one agency, one nursing agency alone, over one weekend, the cost of providing the nurses that they uh, offered that weekend was £78,000. And over one year, that amount accumulated, accumulated uh, would could result in an additional 450 more nurses being employed in our health service. That's the cost of using agencies. It's, of it's a massive cost. And we can't... Well, Michelle, with all due respect, you abandoned the Department of Health for three years or and HHI, left it Jeffrey? rubberless when without a minister. You, you walked London away from the Department of Health. You walked away and left people okay, languishing just, on just waiting Just to be clear, lists. then, if you're so, saying that, that you're saying the DUP won't be staying out of government for three years, we're that's saying, a bad thing. We're saying that we will sit down with our colleagues, agree a programme for government, and that must include fixing the NHS, recruiting more staff, pro, investing the pro, more I, in the health service, need, and helping, yeah, helping yeah, people, yeah, people to get the treatment they need when they need it. And we, that includes access uh, to our GPs. We need, we need Neil, this is nice warm words. The reality is, Geoffrey hasn't been clear. If the protocol still exists next week in its current form, will you sit down with the rest of us and talk about forming a government to deal with the waiting list and to deal with all, all the other things we've talked about? I will about be there tonight. on day one. I will talk uh, and Form negotiate about, oh, well, setting, about setting a programme for government and we need to do that. You need and we need to agree first. the three-year budget before we form the executive. And yes, we do need to deal with the protocol because the protocol, as I've said, no, 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 is no, driving but, up no, the cost will you, will of living. We can do it is that. that our economy. We is can that do that. It is undermining political stability in Northern Ireland. Is the protocol need to address these issues and get them resolved because we need stable, sustainable political institutions in you Northern Ireland. We still, okay, have, we still haven't had an answer. We still haven't away. had an answer as to whether or not the protocol is going to be a block to forming a government. May I pose and a that I think will really you won't have time to answer it. That's, that's, that's have, the problem. I have made that very clear. Well, I have, okay, Jeffrey, we'll have need to, to deal with we'll have the protocol to leave it there, I'm amongst I'm afraid we are out of time. Thank you very much indeed. And that's where we have to leave the leaders' debate. You can find a full list of candidates standing in Thursday's assembly election by visiting bbc.co.uk slash newsni. Now, some of the other parties, that's uh, the TUV, the Traditional Unionist Voice, the Green Party and People Before Profit will be having their say in a specially extended BBC Newsline on BBC One NI at 10.30 and later on the BBC News Channel. 
And uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Good Morning Ulster and The Nolan Show will have reaction across uh, BBC Radio Ulster. So thanks again to all of our party leaders, to Naomi Long, to Geoffrey Donaldson, to Michelle O'Neill, Doug Beatty and to Colm Eastwood. And indeed, thanks to our audience here in Belfast and at home for watching. In 48 hours, the polling stations will close and the decisions will be made. I hope we've helped and a very good night. Thank you. Divisive, uh, or any more divisive, perhaps, than, say, a Brexit <coughs> poll? Well, a Brexit was called by the United Kingdom government. There was a referendum. We had a debate and a decision was taken. And the majority of but people here voted uh, against it. We you supported Jim, Brexit. You must have known it, it, would be, it would be divisive. Whatever way people yes. think about and, Brexit, and, and, it was and divisive. And when a referendum is on a yes-no debate, it's always divisive, yeah, Jim. But, but you wanted to have that debate. But Why would you not say that Michelle O'Neill can have her border poll debate? Because I think... Uh, that it will lead to instability in Northern Ireland. It will not fix the problems that matter happened. to ordinary people. And I think that we need to get on uh, with resolving the issues that are in front of us. And that does mean um, uh, 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 addressing the issues related to the protocol. Okay, let me bring well Naomi, Naomi Long. Your, your, your party, of course, uh, famously sometimes accused of sitting on the fence on these big issues. Uh, so are you going to come off it uh, tonight and answer to this question? Would you like to see a border poll after this election? Well, we're not sitting on the fence. We're tackling the issues that are actually up for debate in the Assembly and we've spent most of the debate so far discussing issues over which the Assembly has no control whatsoever rather than talking about the issues that the Assembly actually can influence and change. So we can change things like how we tackle the cost of living crisis. We can deal okay, with and, our health and, service. And those are all very good issues, but not do, the subject of the what, question. Do you want to see a border poll? Is we can't call a border poll. We can't set no, but the you date can ask for it, one. and we can't influence it. Well, you we're can not influence going to be, it. You we're can ask not for going it. to be asking for a border poll because what we want to do, as I said, when Jeffrey talked about suspending government until he got his way in the protocol, Didn't we're not that. going to talk about suspending government. <coughs> we are going to talk about doing government because we believe that's in the best interest so of the people of Northern Ireland. So you're not going to be the Minister Ireland. of Justice and after be, next Thursday? Well, to be very clear, Jeffrey, Are you suspended? Let's not take... Let's but don't not mislead take the any, public, Naomi. Let's not don't take anything... <coughs> let us not take anything for granted. I don't. Because there's no guarantee who will be the Minister of anything after the election. So let's let the public have their say on that. I'm there in a caretaker capacity at the moment and I will continue in that caretaker capacity until another minister is put in place. But that is not government. That is individual ministers in a caretaker capacity in their departments. Government is about collective action and we can't deal with the health service and the cost of living crisis when we're in silos and we can't meet together okay. and make key decisions no, no, about no, the me, budget. And it me, is true, Jeffrey, yes, no, 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 we're doing the job. Bring Colm Eastwood in. I think we did hear you say that you're not going to call for a border poll. Colm Eastwood, uh, will you be calling for one? No, I will not. People know my view on United Ireland. I think it's pretty clear. Uh, we will plan for it. We're preparing for it now. Um, but that's not today's issue. That's an issue for another day. Today's issue is the fact that we don't even have a government or a guarantee of a government or anybody who's going to step in and deal with the crisis. And we shouldn't get away from this. The crisis that people are going through right now every single day in their own homes, and I think they are, frankly, sick of this. I mean, the only person that's focused on a border poll in, in this election is Jeffrey Donaldson. I mean, what's it about? <laughs> it's the same old story. Sinn Féin are going to be first ministers. We should all be afraid. There's going to be a border poll. We should all be afraid. Well, maybe we should actually realise that the choice in this election is the choice that there, oh, we always have in this place, is that we sit down together as neighbours, work together, and sort out the problems that are facing people. The conversation about the but future of this island... the protocol, um, Colm, because I, you, you, know, I you keep you avoiding protocol. that. You, you know you don't. You're not listening to what unionists are saying. Oh, unionists are saying this protocol is harming our place in the United Kingdom. Well, it is harming talk. our economy. It is undermining political stability. And I hear nothing from okay, you, well, Colm. Well, let the other uh, unionists on the say, panel... Leave it to the EU. Let the other well, unionists on the panel tell us what he thinks unionists are saying on the protocol, since it keeps coming up there. Well, let's be absolutely clear.
here because we need honesty with the people here. And we have been honest since Brexit. We said it would be destabilising uh, and we were right. We talked about the protocol. It would be destabilising. It shouldn't be there. And we were right. And other people had a chance uh, to put, to block it and they didn't. And we did. Uh, you didn't. And we did, it's, yes. well, what we've got, well, if you blocked it, it wouldn't be here. Well, it, if you blocked it, we wouldn't be Prime talking Minister about it. The general election, and, and, and he at, won the I election. Look at you, I look and that's at your, democracy. And I look at your five-point plan. I look at your five-point plan. Remove the Northern Ireland Protocol, and the first bullet underneath it: the protocol must be replaced. Is it remove it or is it replace it? Well, because we are the have. only ones who have said that there's an issue with the protocol, where it's feast or famine. We need to have something that works for absolutely everybody, yeah, so and we haven't done that. So, so not remove it then, because it says remove it here. Yeah, remove it and replace it. I think. Okay. Me, to say, that's, can that's can some of the rest of us have, have a go? Like, the reality is, Geoffrey isn't accepting the fact that every action has a consequence. Geoffrey backed Brexit. People before profit backed Brexit. Nigel Farage backed Brexit. It's a funny group of people who got together to back Brexit to the detriment of people in Northern Ireland. Then we had an opportunity to have the softest possible Brexit. Geoffrey voted against it. Then we had the protocol. Jeffrey, yes, he did vote against it, but your res your actions have led to the protocol. Now we're just trying to deal with so the, the people of the United Kingdom. Not, didn't Jeffrey, vote for I'm going to finish then. the sentence. The, we're now trying to deal with the chaos that has been created by your Brexit, by the Brexit that has been enforced on the people of Northern Ireland. And actually, do you know what? The protocol is a pretty good opportunity oh. for us to create jobs in Northern Ireland if we'd only embrace it. But you want to keep uh, claiming defeat instead of victory? I think we need to sit down again. We'll talk about these issues if you want, Geoffrey, but walking out of government, staying out of government is not going to solve one single issue that you have with the protocol. It OK, let me won't. bring in, bring in the audience uh, here. And, uh, yeah, gentlemen, just, uh, just there. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to challenge the uh, assertion that uh, the border poll makes unionists second-class citizens. I actually think it's quite it ridiculous so, yeah. that unionists are claiming to be second-class citizens, given the history of Northern Ireland as a country. Um, <laughs> My point here is that we've heard tonight from other audience members that people on the border need the protocol. And I will say, yes, there are problems in terms of uh, trading customs across the border, um, with, uh, across the, the, um, the Irish Sea. But what we need to do is streamline the checks across the Irish Sea so that uh, goods can travel freely between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, but also keep the border on the island non-existent as it is as laid out in the Good Friday Agreement. Okay. Uh, anybody uh, got a different view on the border poll? I want to come in. Uh, gentleman there. Yes. Uh, you, sir. Yep. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, how can any self-respecting uh, Northern Ireland uh, uh, politician not oppose uh, the protocol uh, when it has, since the beginning of 2021, imposed <coughs> on Northern Ireland a status which meets the United Nations definition of a non-self-governing territory, a colony? Uh, that involves uh, laws in 300 areas being wrested from Northern Ireland to uh, another polity in which Northern Ireland has no representation. How can any politician sit okay. and, and let that happen uh, without uh, their inaction clearly communicating the fact that they've fallen asleep at the wheel? OK, let me, let me get another uh, comment in from the audience. And, uh, yes, sir. On the issue of borders, um, uh, it wasn't a Sinn Féin agriculture minister or an SDLP agriculture minister that built the border in the Irish Sea, that built the border in the United Kingdom. It was a DUP minister no. who spent a year administering yeah. the border there. Why did the DUP give those who want a border poll a leg up by dividing our country? Well, I'm happy to answer that question. Actually, the fact is, it was the uh, UK department called DEFRA who put the infrastructure in place because the uh, agriculture minister in Northern Ireland refused to do so and ordered his officials not to do it. Uh, that, that infrastructure, and it is temporary, uh, we have refused to put in place any permanent infrastructure at any of the ports in Northern Ireland linked to the protocol. The temporary infrastructure that is there was put in place by DEFRA, the English department, over the heads of the uh, Department of Agriculture in Northern Ireland. And as you know, there's a court case at the moment because there's a challenge to uh, the direction that was given by the Agriculture Minister for all checks to stop. Okay, but, took a year. We had, we, had a, we had a number of political stunts from the DUP to give a pretense that they were not br bringing in the infrastructure that was required, whenever in fact they had to bring it in legally and they were instructed to do so by a British government minister, I might add. 
But let me say this, we wouldn't have a protocol to discuss tonight if we didn't have Brexit. The hardest possible Brexit, which you can take a lot of responsibility for delivering with all the other partners. But what we need to do now is find ways to make the smooth implementation of the protocol, to make it work, to bring that certainty and stability that our business community really desire. We need to have that, otherwise people can't plan for the future. So let's find ways to make the protocol work, to iron out any of the kinks that are there. That's what the rest of us want. Okay. We sought to find mitigation against Brexit and a number of the parties here worked together and we achieved the protocol. And I'm glad we achieved the protocol. Now let's make it work. All right, well, let me, let me, um, let me just pause that uh, there. We'll move on to our next question. Maybe the protocol will come up again. It seems to be a favourite. <laughs> um, so our next question is uh, from Fiona Doran from Belfast, who works in the legal department of a bank. Fiona. Good evening. Um, we're in 2022, one of the wealthiest countries in the Western world. Yet the cost of living crisis has gone beyond heat or eat for working class people. Many people can't afford either. So what is your party pledge to do to tackle this urgent issue specifically? Specifically, Colin Eastwood. Thanks Fiona, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, what's going on in communities across the North right now is scandalous. Uh, the number of food banks that people are going to, people who are going out to work all day long are then having to go to a food bank, and then having to decide whether they can turn their heating on. Um, I, I think it's scandalous. And then we see that BP, for example, are making billions and billions of pounds in profit. It is immoral. Um, and I think we need to do something about it. So there's 300 million pounds in a storm of bank account that can't be spent, uh, of course, because again, I say it again, the DUP walked out of government. But we would put 200 pounds in everybody's pocket. We put 500 pounds in people's pockets here on uh, benefits. We'd extend the free school meals program to make sure the kids can get fed uh, a hot meal uh, at home. We'd give 30 hours free childcare um, uh, to, to, to people who are trying to get out to work. Um, none of that's going to be enough. I think the British government need to do a windfall tax on those companies like BP who are taking us all for a ride, in, in my view. And then we need to cap their profits. There's lots of things that need to be done. So you've, um, you've mentioned we, things which are obviously Westminster's yes, domain, course, but in course, terms of yeah. what will happen at Stormont, uh, do you believe those, those measures are costed, the £200, the yes, £100, pounds, costed, the yeah. childcare? Yes, it, it comes to about £230 million. There's another £100 million in the pot, and we can do other things. I mean, I, I think we should look uh, at making uh, free school meals universal. I, I know there's a campaign for that. We need to get serious about this. The reality is, though, and we can talk about it all night, we can write big, long manifestos, we won't be able to do one single thing if we don't have a government next week. That's what's at stake, and if we don't have a government... The next outcome is that Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg and the rest of them will be running Northern Ireland and they don't care about working class people uh, in Northern Ireland or anywhere else. Uh, Doug Beattie, uh, what are you going to do about it? Well, the, the situation is dire. Uh, it's gone well beyond uh, politicians just sitting here and saying we have a problem. Uh, there are people out there who are really suffering and I mean genuinely uh, suffering and we, we, we can't sit here and do nothing uh, and we have to hold people to account. That £300 million could have been used. It wouldn't have got us through everything. It would have been a very short-term measure, but it could have been used to help people most in need. Uh, and we didn't use it. Even if we'd put the executive up for a day just to pass that legislation, to get that out there, uh, we could have done something, but we didn't. Uh, and that's a, a real failing. And people need to own that failing that we didn't have an executive to be able to spend that money. So it's sitting there, sitting in a bank account while people are cold and while people are hungry. And people will die cold and they will die hungry. We've been calling for a fuel poverty task force uh, since November last year. Uh, uh, Andy Allen has been, has been doing that. And, and we really need to focus on that so we can find out where the problems are and start identifying it. And we also need to have the warm home discount scheme, which they have in England, which is £150 uh, a year to, to, to the most vulnerable households. And that needs to be put in place. But we have to use other levers here and we have to get in to start lobbying Westminster because the 5% VAT on home heating oil can be taken away tomorrow by the UK government uh, and they need to do exactly that. And nobody can say to me, well, they can't because of the protocol. Other countries within the EU are doing exactly that. The UK government could do exactly that. Okay. And the cost of, and if I can, Jim, sorry, the cost of food that, that, that is really causing the issue here is because the cost of fuel going into the vehicles that's transporting that food. That's why food is rising. So we need to get the price of fuel down for those essential users, such as hauliers. If we can lower that down, then what they're transporting, the cost of that will lower also. Okay, Michelle O'Neill. Um, 
We've, heard, we've heard a number of policies here. Your party also has ones about uh, immediately spending that 300 million. But have you anything else more, you know, more ambitious in terms of raising money to deal with these long-term problems? There are long-term problems, but there are immediate problems. And the cost of living that Fiona referred to is obviously the thing that's pressing most on people. And it isn't just, you know, the more vulnerable in society. It's actually people who are out, the two people maybe in the house, working all day, coming home, and still not being able to make their bills. And I think that is the struggle that we face. But there are things... But yeah, you talk about working people. For instance, Northern yep. Ireland has 25% of the workforce is in the public sector. Now, that's something Stormont has yep. uh, power over. What are you going to do about public sector workers' wages? You know, we're talking nurses, we're talking policemen, civil servants. <clears throat> uh, are they going to get an inflation... Uh, equal pay increase, because that would mean a pay increase of 9%. Yeah, yeah so I, and let me come back to that. But I think just to answer Fiona's point around what we would do, because I think it's important yeah, I'm to put that you, out there. Is that yes, something I, you would I, do? I, I will come back to that, sure. But I think in terms of being able to deal with the cost of living crisis in the here and now, £230 into every household is what we're proposing. And that's fully costed in terms of what Connor put forward, Connor Murphy put forward as the finance minister. But that's only one thing alongside all the other energy fuel support schemes that we've also brought forward. But Doug's absolutely right. There's a lot of these things that are not within the gift of the Assembly. They're the powers that still lie in Westminster. And I can assure you there's nobody in the Tory party who's sitting worrying at night over how they're going to heat their home or put food on their table. And they have failed to act in the way... But have so you thought what, what, about something like public sector pay? Yes, we're going to have to have all those conversations because just before... But you have a policy on